So welcome everyone to our third annual um, Ash Academy Black Entrepreneur Expo Mixer STEM panel. That's a mouthful, isn't it? I'm Crystal Jones. I'm the Ash Academy board president, and I have a wonderful panel today to introduce. So I'm going to start to what I see is my top um, left, Tamara Martinez from Mar Medtronic, Renee Barber from Medtronic also, and Phoebe Swan from Medtronic. So we're coming Medtronic strong here. Lexis Shello, Latrice Johnson, and Marcy Bryant. Ladies, say hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good hello, awesome. hello, hello, everybody. I appreciate you all for doing this and participating um, in this because, you know, this is this is this is major. Um, <clears throat> let me just um, have you guys introduce yourself to our audience. Um, Tamara, if you could just tell us briefly who you are and what you do. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Tamara Martinez and I'm a program manager for the Global Quality OpEx team at Medtronic. And uh, really what that means is that I manage projects, uh, programs across the enterprise uh, to help uh, create better processes and so that in the end, we can uh, deliver great products to our customers. Excellent. Renee Barber. Yes, um, Renee Barber, Senior Director of Enterprise Accounts um, at Medtronic. Um, what that means is I work very closely with our sales teams um, and my group, we support our largest customers, so the largest hospital systems within the US um, doing business systems. We do business processes um, to support the sales teams, um, data analytics, um, customer tracking, uh, account tracking and profiles. So all of the behind the scenes commercial support for our sales teams. Excellent. Thank you so much. Phoebe. Thank you, Crystal. So I'm Phoebe Swan. I am a global inclusion, diversity, and equity um, leader for Medtronic. And I serve in the space of executive councils and awards. And outside of my day job, I am the founding executive director of My Adoration, who provides education and well being for children in Uganda. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for being here. Lexi, shallow, shallow, shallow. God, I'm going to get this right. <laughs> it's okay. Common mistake. That's fine. I'm My head keeps saying the wrong thing. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all good. Um, Lexi Shello, I am a contracting officer for the federal government and I work in IT acquisitions. So what that basically means is other Agencies come to my agency and we serve as business consultants for them and all of their IT related needs and purchases. Thank you so much for being here. Latrice Johnson. Hi everyone, I'm Latrice Johnson. I am head of legal operations at a global cybersecurity company called Palo Alto Networks. My team and I focus on operational excellence supporting the legal organization who ultimately ends up supporting the rest of the company from everything that has to do with people, process, and technology. Excellent. Thank you for being here with us. And Marcy. Hi, everybody. I'm Marcy Bryant. I am currently a content creator for Ford Pro, which is the commercial vehicle arm of uh, Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, Michigan. I am excited to be here. Uh, what I am primarily responsible for in my role is uh, reviewing, editing, and uh, participating in the development of all forms of content that are distributed throughout North America, whether it's through sales reps, uh, dealerships, our websites, brochures, or uh, even at events and trade shows. Excellent. Thank you all for being here so much. I appreciate you guys. You guys are truly um, giants in your, in your um, area, and we appreciate your time. So let's just kick off um, my first question for the panel and no one in particular, so feel free to jump in. What do you guys think we can do to advance STEM 
and STEM careers for um, people of color. Um, what what do you what what's your thoughts there? How can we make that happen? I think that it starts with exposure. Um, the, the biggest piece is breaking down the barriers. I think all young people, and I'll use this as an example, all young people play video games and helping them understand that they can create their own video game and what do they need to learn and understand and you make it fun and you make it interesting. And there is the ability to, if you enjoy the hands-on pieces, the Legos and the building blocks and all those things. So really what it starts with is exposure. The more our kids are exposed and they can be creative, that's how they make the connection that, oh, this is a what an engineer does, or this is what I do in IT, or this is what I do in these spaces. And the minute they can make that that kind of connection, the, the actual academic and the work piece of it doesn't seem quite that hard. In their mind, they just know that they're having fun. Yeah, I want to echo on, on that because I'm a product of that exposure myself. Um, Growing up, coming from Jamaica and, and uh, you know, not much means, um, never seeing anyone in, in roles such as engineering that look like me. Um, I In seventh grade, I remember uh, uh, career day, a woman came in and spoke about being an engineer and working on helicopters and it blew me away. And I ran home just yelling to the sky, to my mom about it. And uh, she, I'm, I, at that time I was pretty reserved. So um, she took me seriously and um, she got me more, further exposure to engineering. And uh, once she worked at, at, at Yale as an admin um, and all of a sudden I, I met a discussion about nanotechnology. Um, I don't know what a seventh grader needed to be in a <laughs> discussion, but you know, she prodded me on, go talk to the speaker, go do this and that. And um, that's really that exposure, just seeing someone and uh, just a female. Uh, I never knew females could be engineers um, talking about that. So I think we need to make sure we have visibility. Our kids have that visibility um, that from people that look like us and then just get that support to just know that, um, yeah, the academic piece, that's the easy part. I would say, <laughs> you know, for me, it's it's been interesting because I'm not in a technical role. Um, I think one of the the reasons how I end up getting a job within a technology company is, I think from a really early age, my mom always instilled a lot of confidence in me that I can do anything and really believe in my skills. And so working in financial services, um, I didn't even know that there were jobs like this in, in tech, right? And there's money to be had if you have other skills. And so I had to really remind myself, you know, when, and I joined a legal department, which also is intimidating when you're around attorneys who constantly remind you, I don't have a job, you know, a JD. And I think one of the, the things that really helped me become successful is I really believed in my skills and said, you know what, you're right. You have a JD and I don't. But at the end of the day, we're sitting at the same table trying to get across and trying to improve this organization collectively. And, you know, everyone brings different skills. And I think for me, that has been a huge driver because I don't have the exact path that everyone else did. I've done different jobs outside of technology, but I have skills. I have a curiosity to learn. I love building relationships. I ask questions and that continues to allow me to be successful in a tech company, regardless of whatever my background is. Um, you know, I now manage technology for a multi, you know, global legal department that if you would ask me 10 years ago when I came into this, I would have laughed and like, oh, never going to happen. But here I am. And I absolutely love my job every single day. And I can't imagine doing anything else. I um, that's sick. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, it's okay. I'd like to jump in here and say that uh, I think that it's, uh, there are two things that are really important. One is making sure that the, the STEM related activities that students have uh, are actually of interest to them and are actually fun. And then also helping them understand that you can be in STEM and not actually be a STEM professional. There are a variety of skills that these companies need. So if you are in education, so for instance, um, my high school had a math science uh, 
and applied technology program. And it's because of, of that and, and my experience in radio TV Vogue Tech that I was in, in as early as, as seventh grade that allowed me to choose STEM as my industry. So I think there's a twofold opportunity there. I just wanted to piggyback real quick off of that because I think, you know, as everyone was saying, the exposure and making that connection um, and how tech interferes or STEM just connects with other industries is a really big thing that I think is neglected a lot of the time. A lot of time if you ask, you know, young people or people trying to find their professional path, do you want to go into STEM? They think, you know, app development, uh, and things along those nature and that nature. And that is part of it, you know, but there are so many other avenues to go. I was in marketing. I had no idea I was going to ever jump into any type of tech role until I went in on a trip for a college and they were saying, you know, we use big data to, um, to find ways to capture consumers. And we look at and see what they buy. And then we develop marketing campaigns based off that. And I was like, well, now, wait a minute. I can use data to figure out how to get people to buy my stuff. Like that's, that's what, oh, you know, how do I learn how to do that? And that's kind of how I, I dived into that role, but making those, those connections, you know, you can apply tech to marketing. You can apply, apply tech to biz ops, you know, legal operations and things like that. I think really communicating that early on um, less people know that you can really widen the scope. You're not just going into app development um, or graphic design or coding, you know, you, you can go well outside of that. Yeah, I always tell people, I'm like, you have to remember that there needs to be business people and finance people to support all the engineers to spend the money. <laughs> so, or you have to think of it like you almost end up coming up with a hashtag, like there's tech in that. So yeah. you can be yes. in any industry, you know, you can be automotive, you could be clothing, you, you want to go, there's, you know, TV, radio, sports, Nike, you know, pick an industry, pick a company, there's tech in that. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, that's the thing that our young people need to know. So if you, you know, if, if you name a company or you name a place or you name something that you're interested in doing, I can probably name for you three or four different tech roles that are part of that industry. And that's what I say when it gets down to it is helping young people make that connection. Um, so does does the rapper make the most money? No. The person who wrote it, arranged it, engineered it, did the designing in the background, those are the people that make the money. So and they can still walk around the city and not be harassed by paparazzi. So <laughs> it's a win-win scenario. So it's helping yeah. them make that connection. And so yeah, I think if we walk away and kind of leverage, you know, hashtag this tech in that. That's the part that our folks, our, our young people need to see. And can we also, also get a hashtag tech money? Because there is absolutely well, money in tech <laughs> and that needs to be part of the conversation. It's yeah. like very inspiring. Mm -hmm. I, also, I also think that we need to demystify what STEM is because people hear STEM. So, you know, and you, the first thing is, what is that? And you say science, technology, engineering, and math. And so a couple of things always come immediately to people's heads. So they hear science and math and immediately you're thinking of doctors and scientists and yes, it's that, but it's so many other things. Um, people are surprised when I tell them that nurses are considered a STEM career. It's not just the doctors. In fact, it's a lot of people in the medical profession. Um, it's, the, it's not just being the scientist. Sometimes it's just the, the, the lab techs themselves, but there's, there's a broad range of careers that encompass STEM. And when we talk about the technology, what you guys say, that rings the truest for me because I'm in technology. There's tech in that. And it isn't always the people who are writing the code. It isn't the people who are building the computers. And it's not always the, no offense to anyone with an engineering degree, it's not always the engineers. And it's not even always the people with the engineering degrees. So, because I think I'm the, I'm not the only one. I do believe Latrice and I believe probably Marcy and maybe Lexi um, um, uh, were kind of evenly split the number of what I call non-traditional um, degrees um, that still led to a, um, a career in tech. My degree is in behavioral science with a minor in public administration. And let me be clear, 
my career had already started when I was finishing up college and I had no intention of changing my minor and my major or my minor. And people have asked, well, once you saw your career going into tech, did you think about changing that? Nope. I was interested in working. I was not interested in studying it because they want to make you do programming. I didn't want to do programming. <laughs> um, and in that, <laughs> now that I've said that, um, Lexi, what is your degree in? Because I want to show for the people viewing this that, you know, because I know Tamara, I know um, Renee. Phoebe, I think you also have an engineering degree as well. Do you not? I have a business degree. I started in engineering. I ah, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I, wa I kind of want to just show, you know, it, the technology or STEM doesn't require the traditional degrees, and this is no offense to anyone who's got it, that is certainly a path. I just want to show there are other paths. Lexi, what's your degree in? So my degree um, across the board, my bachelor's, master's, and I'm finishing up my doctorate, they're all in business. So okay, I don't have any, um, I didn't go and get a tech degree, uh, in, an engineering degree. Um, I found a concentration and I was like, all right, we're going to make these the electives as I go along the way. Um, to explore what I was interested in, but yeah, you, you just apply. I applied it and ended up in, in my role now. Like I didn't need any type of IT or engineering degree. And Latrice, cyber cybersecurity. And, and what's your the degree? Legal department. My degree is finance, um, and so I just I you know I don't have any sort of technical certifications. Um, the only kind of certifications I thought about getting were related to project management, but nothing in a tech space at all. And Marcy, I know you're an MBA, but what was your undergrad in? I have a BA in advertising. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, so, so let me get- Essentially, it was my, my middle school and my high school uh, being part of the Detroit area pre-college engineering program and the math science and applied technology program in high school that got me in STEM. It had nothing to do with my college education at all. Nice. So um, I think we might've touched on some of this, but let me just ask again, Renee, I'm gonna start with you. What has helped you get to where you are in your career? And what advice do you have for others who wanna set off in a similar direction? I, I think of it in twofold. Um, one, being willing to take calculated risks. Um, there really weren't too many opportunities that I said no to. So whether it was taking a role that moved me from you know, my hometown of Wisconsin and, and took me at, at that point to a little town in Georgia. Um, you know, so the city mouse going to the country. So that was a big adjustment. Um, but being willing to take a chance has taken me to China, it's taken me to France, it's taken me to Africa, um, it's put me in supply chain roles, commercial roles, automotive, um, and given me all these exposure and opportunities that I would not have had. Uh, I think the second piece was um, I came from a line of, I'll call it headstrong women, um that so there wasn't such a thing as a girl role and a boy role growing up uh, mm -hmm. or this is what you're able to do you can um my grandmother fussed that there were no supervisors there was no black supervisors at the the factory she worked at and became the first black supervisor my mm -hmm. mom you know passed different roles because she wanted to run one of the larger banks downtown. So instead of going in a traditional black neighborhood where they put other you know, black you know, bank execs, she didn't want that. So um, it, I've come from a line where the, the idea is, one, you can take the risk because your family's there for you. I knew no matter what happened, my family is part of that foundation and that rock. There was nothing that we would always come up with an answer. That was my mom's thing. Whatever it is, we may not know exactly how to figure it out, but we're going to come up with a solution. So I think having that base of being able to, you know, you're not jumping off a cliff without a parachute, um, but be confident in trying something that maybe you haven't done. Um, those two things I think have made me 
the most successful because it's just opened you know more doors and it's given me exposure to to things that otherwise in my own natural my you just have to have faith i mean you know, there's faith in i'm going to try this and learn something there's faith in i'm going to try this and know that my family is there behind me there's faith in i'm going to get on this plane and fly 14 hours and go somewhere and i will find someone who speaks english or at least i'll find some way to get to the office in a hotel and you get these experiences so Yes, there is that fearlessness and a little bit, little bit of fearlessness and a little bit of faith. Excellent. Marcy, same question to you. Can you repeat the question for me, please? I sure can. Thank you. So, hold on. My notes aren't coming up. What has helped you get to where you are? Um, and what advice do you have for others who want to follow in your footsteps, as it were? So um, number one, adults keep asking the kids what they want to be when they grow up, because that question um, really made me think about what I wanted to be. Uh, in sixth grade, the first day of sixth grade, they asked us what high school we wanted to go to. Uh, and they wanted us to come up with an answer, even though it was three years away. They said we needed to start planning. Um, in ninth grade, thinking about what I needed to do to to get my GPA together to afford scholarships uh, for college. So just having people in your lives um, that you can talk to about your future and your plans. And then once you come up with that, be adamant about the destination, but flexible about the journey. And realize that the goal that you have is a working document. Your goals always evolve. And the entire purpose of accomplishing one goal is to prepare you to for the next level of success in a whole new goal. So don't just get stuck in one thing. Continue to evolve. And as long as you're flexible about the journey, your destination can end up being more beautiful than you even envisioned. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And one last one, Tamara. Same question to you. What has helped you? What has helped you get to where you are? And what advice would you give to others who want to set off in a similar direction? So I came up with this little acronym, G R R. Or I say Gur because I have a three-year-old and she loves dinosaurs, and she's always gurring at me. So um, I always think about doing good. So that's where the G comes from. Good. Um, Look for areas for growth. So whenever, usually when I'm scared about something, that means I should go do it. <laughs> and then um, risk, you know, um, that's part of it too, the risk. And then just repeat. That's It's going to be a cycle of just growing. And um, similar to what Renee and Marcy already said, you know, having people in my life, people that I didn't know um, they were cheering for me or pushing me or, um, that they were mentors, you know, that word mentor, uh, even in high school, college, there are people there outside of my family, um, whether it was a teacher or administrator that just uh, took an interest and supported me in little ways, like, um, you know, not having the funds to go to a conference when I was in college, uh, NSBE, National Society of Black Engineers uh, conferences, and I was sharing that with the administrator and she said, hmm, our department has a budget for that and supported me going to a conference that led to, you know, internship opportunities and things like that. Um, so, you know, other people have poured in things to me and, um, you know, and seen that good. And so that's also part of it. What can I, what can I do to leave a little space of goodness? And it doesn't have to be this big grand thing, but, um, you know, the next person next to my team member or, um, somebody junior in the company and just looking out for them because so many people looked out for me. Um, so yeah, so grr, it's good, grow, risk, repeat. Excellent. So Miss Phoebe, I have a question for you. Um, given the, <laughs> I, hate, I, I hate the term renewed interest, but that's kind of what it is. Given the renewed interest in um, inclusion and diversity that seems to be permeating the corporate world, what do you think is the impact um, um, has been on um, that new fo found focus and careers in STEM and what's that looking like? 
Um, That's a great question. I heard someone earlier say that their parents or their family instilled in them, they can do anything. And I believe the renewed focus um, reinforces our values. It reinforces our significance. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we're so marginalized. No, I'm not gonna say marginalized. We're underrepresented and then underestimated. Um, a lot of us have great skills to bring to the table. We could be CEOs, but if people don't take time to get to know us, if we don't feel confident. So I believe the renewed emphasis is opening people in, in addition to allies. There are people who wanna be connected, but maybe they had no reason or no nudge to lean in. Now you have a nudge. So what are you gonna do with that nudge? So I am glad that it's a renewed uh, focus. I think it's gonna help people think about where they wanna go. I'll just share my short story. Um, in Wisconsin, the um, School of Engineering, Milwaukee School of Engineering is popular. I joined there. Um, I was the only female. I was the only black person and I'm outspoken. And so the professors would put their glasses down. Yes, Ms. Swan, they were, I was an annoyance. And so if we can embrace people and let them know that um, align your values and your passions, and then don't let people sway you from it. Just because you're not received because of the package that you have doesn't mean that you're the best gift to organizations. So I'm glad we have a renewed interest in inclusion diversity, but I believe everyone has a role in it and we'll do this cycle again. This is cyclical. We all are in, all the companies are excited about it and then we pull back. And I wanna encourage um, all of us to be leaders and to open doors and opportunities for those that are underrepresented. Thank you, thank you. So uh, this isn't really a question, it's more of a statement and wanted to get some thoughts and feedback from the group. So one thing that's been on my mind lately, I've been spending a lot more time on LinkedIn than I usually do, but um, I see a lot more posts um, praising people of color doing great things or women, you know, first time, first generation, you know, you know, first, 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 all over the place. There's always one, you know who they are, one or more, generally more and a lot more of um, certain type of folks who um, feel some kind of way on the call out on either the, the ethnicity or the gender and express it in such a way that they want to try to say that, well, if you weren't calling this out, we wouldn't have this division that we have now. Mm -hmm. um, and that calling this out is somehow making this division deeper. It somehow makes you a racist. And I'm, I, I know how I feel about this <laughs> and I could easily go, but I'm not going to. But I wanted to get some thoughts and perspectives. When you hear that, it comes across to me as if um, we're being told, well, because, you know, I've got a panel here of very successful women. So because we're successful, um, there is no such thing as, you know, um, racism or discrimination. And none of that happens, um, certainly not to us Black people and certainly not to us women because, well, here, here we are, must not be happening. What's your thoughts about that sort of mindset that that says that, you know, because we've got examples of success, that there is no problem anymore? What y'all think about that? Um, and I'm going to I know that Phoebe's the obvious choice, but I am going to start with you, Phoebe. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you did, because I was getting ready to open my mouth. I, <laughs> I would amplify it louder. I've learned that that's noise. When people start uh, nitpicking and 
um, I always have people tell me with these global programs that I run, I have people saying, well, why can't you just blend them all together? Because what we're trying to do is let young people know that they can do anything and they can be successful. And most of the time we're leveling the, 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 we're leveling the playing grounds. Usually um, when you come in, you don't necessarily have the same connections. You don't have the same opportunities. And so your pay from the beginning starts at a different level. Your um, people believing in you that you can do it and do even more is the expectations are lower until you get in there and you wow people, then they start. So I would amplify it. I would keep on doing it. And it's a shame that every 10 to 15 years, we go back around where um, it's not an emphasis on it then there's an emphasis on it. But we should be black and proud. We should let black girls know that your hair is cute and it's not your hair, but it's what's underneath that hair and that brain that's gonna make the largest contribution. So um, I think it's noise. So when they do it, I, um, I don't fight them on social media, but I know that there's a measure of ignorance and there's something about having a sense of belonging. Do you know how many uh, children are either homeless because of unfortunate situations, black and being told that you don't matter? So whenever we have the opportunity to amplify it, we need to do it. And if you're not doing better, then you need to go home, take your ball and go home. I also think that's probably how I tell people I, I, I cringe when I hear the term diversity of thought. I feel like that, came, that, that term came from someone who wanted to feel included that was not a part of, of being amplified. Um, and to Phoebe's point, you know, there are a lot of situations where people like us, we don't have these examples growing up. We don't see examples of that. Um, probably until we're a little bit later in our careers. And so it was interesting because I think when I was in college um, and I have you know amazing women now who say there's a difference between being an ally and an advocate. And I kid you not that one of my first my first job at Adobe, most of my I'm, my managers did not look like me even till this day, most of the people who I report into don't look like me. And I remember having a very honest conversation with a boss who who took credit for something that she did not necessarily do. It was another woman of color in our department. Um, and I had this moment where I, I kind of called her out on it. And I was like, I honestly would probably be a little frustrated if I was in that person's shoes because she deserved credit. And I don't feel like you gave it to her. And I remember my boss looking at me like, did this girl just tell me, put me in? And I said, because you know what, most of the time people are not willing to speak up. They're not willing to say anything about it. And that person, that behavior continues. Mm -hmm. And so it one takes someone to have the strength to speak up, even if it makes someone else feel uncomfortable, but also rem reminding people and your peers and your manager sometimes, are you my ally or are you my advocate? Are you going to speak up for me when I'm out of the room? And are you gonna create more spaces? for people who look like me, even though they don't look like you. And I think and that in itself, go ahead. You know, when I, when I see those comments, my first thought is that's a person speaking from fear. Mm -hmm. yep. There is absolute fear in, they can manage the ones and the twos. It's one person in the room and they can justify. And as long as I can justify why maybe you're in that room, I can deal with that. And it's easy to put it in a box of diversity. It's easy to put it in a box of, okay, we need to, whatever box you need to check. And then I think back to, you know, many, many years of being, you know, in, in, in especially automotive and engineering, you're going to be the only female in the space. You're going to be the only person of color in a space. And those first couple of years, you're the young person in the space. And you look like somebody's daughter, granddaughter, whatever it is, and here you are sitting in the meeting. But that is fear because they can manage the ones and the twos. Mm -hmm. When you start getting 
multiple and now it's in their face and it is and, and I kind of laugh because even as we go through it you can tell that that some folks are having maybe diversity burnout where it feels like why are we still talking about this mm-hmm. and like we're still talking about it because as long as I can count on one hand the number of leaders and executives we don't talk about how many African-American athletes there are you don't ask how many African-American basketball because nope. there's so many when it was just Jackie Robinson in baseball that we were still talking about it (laughs) right he stood out as because there was one now you don't talk about it so as long as and that's my rule as long as i still can only count on one i only need one hand you know one hand for the number of african-american ceos or you know women of color in certain positions in certain roles when i look at your org chart and i have to see how many levels do i need to go before i find a person of color as long as i still have to do the hunting and searching that's why we continue to have the conversation. That's why it continues to be relevant. That's why we're not going to stop talking about it. And I think back to our grandparents and their parents who were intelligent and smart and understood and never had a chance. So someone yep. has to clean the house, uh, clean a house when they could have been a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer and did not have that opportunity. So, okay just because I went to college has nothing to do with the other 100,000 people who have the skill set and the ability and just need the opportunity. Mm -hmm. One person does not negate the others. Mm -hmm. And so I am merely just one pebble in and one ripple. And so we are going to call out and you highlight every, we're just starting to learn more about what we did. So Hidden Figures is still my favorite movie and it always makes me want to cry. and you realize how many years, it was almost 30 years, that's how I, that's how I remember it, from when uh, Mary Jackson, that, that woman, she, her getting her engineering degree, 30 years later, I'm in at Marquette getting my engineering degree, and there's still, the year I graduated, there were three of us. It was myself and two black males. Ooh. So you think that time, and we didn't even hear their story until uh-huh. almost another 20 years after that. So we're just getting into telling our story and what we've been able to do and and the accomplishments and all the things that people have taken for granted because it's just there and you didn't know where it came from. So this drumbeat to me feels like it needs to continue because it's the only way people are going to understand that the numbers matter. That's so true. You know, you just reminded me I didn't finish my story. So I started off in engineering. My junior year, I switched to business. The scrutiny of everything that I said, the siloing and not bringing me into projects in engineering was was very disappointing. But I think if we had arms and extended um, resources and programs that would support people of color, it really probably would have changed the trajectory. I'm glad where I'm at, I'm in a sweet spot. But when I think about people operating out of fear, like what Barbara, what Renee Barbara said, is that I see more of that done, um, what do you call it, is not, is overtly done, or there's things that are done where it's it's very systemic, so you may not see it. Um, I'm glad when we have the people who who blast it, then I know who you are, but Mm -hmm. we have a lot of systemic and we have a lot of things that people are doing it, but they won't say it or they won't be upfront about it. So I'm more concerned about those hidden agendas, those hidden um, opportunities to shut things down or they don't believe. And you know, why do you have to call out black people or black women, but they won't say it out loud. So I'm more concerned about those. Those are the ones I wanna find and help them educate them. And a lot of times people don't get it till their family's affected, till their daughter marries a black brother or something. Then all of a sudden that compassion, that advocacy, oh, my grandbaby, yeah. Well, we're all part of the human race. And we were part of the human race before your grandbaby turned black. So, (laughs) you know, I just think I'm more concerned about those hidden agendas and systemic things that we don't know about those that scream loud, you throw a rock in there and they scream loud, I'm glad they scream, then you know. 
But you got those that don't scream, but they're doing things mm -hmm. and they're marginalizing and they're really um, ensuring that um, people don't go anywhere. That's why we love Phoebe. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. <laughs> Can That's I jump in on that? Can I jump yes, in on that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Whew. Thank you for asking this question. So first things first, I don't let them being them stop me from being me. I understand that their perspective is a result of their experiences. And regardless of what I share with them, there's nothing that uh, can surpass their experiences. So no matter what I tell them, that's something that they will never experience. And no matter what they tell me, they can't take away from all the microaggressions and um, the code switching that I've had to do and, and the, the minimizing and bending myself just to fit into a corporate America. And I remember getting to a space where I said, you know, I'd rather be broken homeless than have a job and just be unraveling just because I'm trying to fit in. So mm -hmm. it was important for me to say, I have got to focus on my skills where I am so good that I can show up as myself and be demanding about the type of space that I want to be in, the type of people that I want to work with. Even the company that I work for now, I, I started off as a contractor there. My very first experience was full of microaggression, uh, uh, microaggressions with a, a female Caucasian manager that just really tried to minimize me in every way she could. And I didn't have an interest in working with the company at the time. So I was happy when I got laid off, but then they changed CEOs and they changed focus and so many things and all these different layers of bureaucracy started shrinking. And I got invited to interview uh, a few years after I had my daughter, maybe about two years later. And I got invited to the commercial vehicle department. And when I got there, the, the hiring manager their manager was there and she looked like me. And inside of this space, there are, um, there are Indian people, there are uh, Asian Americans, there are so many uh, black women in leadership positions. I see power that looks like me. And that makes me feel good. And I still have very small microaggressions, but guess what I do? I call it out in that moment in front of everybody. I don't go cry in the car. Yep. Let's talk about this right now, because what you're not going to do is think that I'm going to play with. I'm here to make money. I'm a professional. I'm taking up space. I will be respected in the same way that I respect you. I'm a professional. I am powerful. And if you do not respect me, you will feel my wrath. I can always find another job, but you're going to find this respect right now. Yep. That's all. Yep. I, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> You guys are awesome. All right. Let me pull another question out my bag. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so kind of um, continuing on that, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing um, um, people of color in STEM at the moment? Um, where do you think um, the challenges lie? I'd like to touch on that real quick. Um, at least one of the things that I see uh, when, and struggled with myself is, you know, growing up, I was always taught, you know, do your job, do what you need to do, lay low, keep your head down, you know, and work in the background. And that's just what society tells you. That is not necessarily coming from my family. So really training myself to be like, okay, I'm going into STEM fields, which we, we know are, have been historically known to be male dominant fields. Um, so I'm going in there as a woman, a woman of color, and I have to tell myself, you know, take, take credit for your work. You know, don't just do something and pass it off to someone else to take credit for. Know that you belong in a room, and in that room, I'm allowed to take up space, and I have a voice, and I have something that needs to be heard. And I think really instilling that type of confidence in, you know, professionals, Black professionals, um, will really go a long way because you see it happen so much, at least I do, you know, they'll go, we'll come into workspaces, we'll do our work, we'll be excellent at our job in whatever career field we're in, and then allow it to be, you know, give it to whoever our boss may be, and we don't go up for those other roles because in our minds, you know, we're just here to do the work, make our money, go home, and in some sense, that's true, but you've got to be your own advocate. You, 
you're the reason that you're going to advance on. And so I think breaking that mental belief that we have to stay in the in the background, we can make noise for ourselves. And I think that that's something that's really um, important for Black professionals and upcoming young Black professionals to, to remember. What I like about what Lexi said is know that you belong there. In addition to knowing that you belong there, you got to connect with other like-minded mm -hmm. people. Find your tribe. Find those people who are doing what you do. Even if they're in another state, ask aunt, auntie, grandma, who else do we know that's in this? Because you're going to need a support system. Um, whether you're starting off in junior high or high school and you, you're, you're knowing the path you want to go in STEM, start connecting with other kids who have that interest because the challenges of today are going to look so different tomorrow and you're going to need a network to help support you in it. So I think one of the things that are missing is connecting people with like uh, professional goals. Um, if we could get them into, I always talk about community of practices and communities of this and communities of that, but where's their communities? Where can they just hang out when, when you're out of school with some other people who like playing video games and designing them? I have, um, my son is a philosophy uh, teacher for ninth grade and he hangs out with STEM people all the time, all the time. And so when I look at these people, I'm like, these are really entrepreneurs that are in roles that they're fitting in. But when I look at where they spend most of their time and their energy, it's around people who like doing stuff like that. So if we can help build communities of support, we really could um, encourage people to stay or to move into STEM and STEM is vast. How do we let people see and, and young people see what STEM is and how it's connected? There's so many roles. Yep. And I always talk about CEOs because in our DNA, and I'm going to say it, it's entrepreneurship or creating stuff. It's just in our DNA. Whether you're baking cookies and then selling them or whatever, entrepreneur is there. But a lot of times when we think of STEM, we think of engineer, we think of chemists and scientists, and then we think we're individual contributors when that leadership really is in your DNA. And if you saw the bigger picture, you might find things that you may have more of a passion for. So yep. how do we put a flame under that passion that they have and connect them with other people with like passion? Yeah, and I think also, you know, um, connecting to that is, creating that, that, that um, community is, is really access, access to the information, access to funds to go to camp around STEM or programs that have STEM or access to be able to go to college. Um, you know, those, as I, um, you know, uh, help with the recruiting of folks coming in as interns uh, or right out of um, college, their first role, you know, I, I, I when I interview people that look like me, their resume does not have internships. Mm -hmm. uh, bright students, and and you know when we get this rubric of what we're looking for um, coming in, it's people with experience. Well, they never had the experience, and then you know sometimes I have these uh, conversations with some of the people that don't look like me, like, oh wow, you know you've had a couple of different uh, internships on your resume. You know how did you make those connections? Oh, my neighbor, or oh, my mom, my dad knew, you know, they have those, those connections, those, those points of access. So it's access and then changing also the perspective from a corporate view, I think, you know, and as, as corporations are going out and looking for talent, is to be more creative in how they connect talent to the business and not always looking for these very, you know, boxed in rubric of what we should be looking for and having to take all these boxes because there's a lot of talent that we miss out on um, because of that. Uh, so yep. I think is one of the big ones. Because you didn't go to the right school or you went to the wrong school or you didn't go to the school that they think of. And I think of my own alma mater. So I started out college at UCLA. My mother was super thrilled. I hated every moment at UCLA. No offense to the Bruins. It just, it didn't 
I went to a small high school. My graduating class was 63 people. And if you give me a moment, I can probably name all 63 of them. So going to UCLA was like country mouse meet city mice. I just, and I wasn't ready for it. And it wasn't a culture fit for me. Years later, I ended up at Dominguez Hills. Turns out that's where I should have gone in the first place. And Dominguez Hills is an interesting school because it sits in Carson, California. And so because it's a CSU, that's traditionally considered a PWI. It's not considered a HBCU. But because of where Dominguez Hills sit, guess what 90% of our school population is? It's mm-hmm. all people of color, whether they're Latino or Black. Um, so we're not really an HBCU, but we're still considered a PWI because we're part of the CSU system. But it was a good culture fit for me because I saw all kinds of people that looked like me in the classroom sizes were much smaller, which for the country mouse was much better for me. Um, But those, those students coming out of there, there's lots of brilliance, you know, um, at the professor level and at the student level. But as a university, we were overlooked because we're not, uh, you know, big name school. And so it's assumed that there's no talent there. I was like, there's plenty of talent besides me. Uh, There's plenty of talent coming out of that school, you know, and I don't want to say I'm an example, but I am an example. You know, I don't want to self-deprecate. I am an example coming out of that school, but so were thousands of other students, but yet they don't look at schools like that. And so the talent is being overlooked. Mm -hmm. I'll also add to that because I think one thing that I, I hear resonate with all of us is at some point in our careers, we were the first or the only in the room. And I think that for people coming in, you know, of course you're going to look for people like us and you may not find it. And that's where that sense of community, I think that all of us were talking about where if you don't have that at work, you're going to need it outside of work. Um, You know, one of the brunches that we just did um, for black women in tech, we had someone who drove six hours um, yep. from Arizona to California to attend this brunch because she said, I don't have people in my company who look like me. I don't have those people in my organization. And I needed this space to come and vent and talk about the challenges I face every single day. And so I think as people go into it, you know, we're creating more space for all of us to come together. But also you have to know that some of that journey may be part of it being you alone and being the only in that yep. space until you create that space for others to join you. Um, and you almost scary. to be afraid of. <laughs> it, yeah. it, you you almost... shouldn't be afraid of it. And no. I think to, I was fortunate between high school and college to be in inroads. And that was an organization at the time. And it was for, um, Black, Hispanic, Native American in engineering business. I think they did a finance, they did nursing, you know, they kind of expanded it a little bit. But what I loved about it, and I don't know that I appreciated it until I got older, the pre-college program um, that they started in high school, they had us, we, I remember vividly, um, they had us do sessions in the summer. And it was when you come into interview, What does your interview dress need to look like? What does, you know, as you talk through your interview and getting comfortable speaking in front of people and getting comfortable talking about your, because when you're young, you don't have this extensive resume of, you have all these different experiences, but so how do you come across and kind of share what's unique about you or special about you or why this company is, you know, you have skills that they need or things that you're willing to learn. And they helped us get prepared for that space. And that's one of the things that I think I see now that almost is a little heartbreaking to me is when we talk with our students, they're they're really quiet and a little more shy. And so you're trying to draw things out of them like you've got some great stuff here. And so I feel like our young people are at a disadvantage because they don't have the, the, the prep. You don't have someone in your house that's already professional to help you kind of figure it out. You know, I laugh and say at the, at the time, you know, I'm, I'm totally aging myself here. Um, you know, when I was going to go, it was Rockwell. So it was Alan Bradley before Rockwell bought them. And I'm going to go and have my interview. And my mother took me to casual corners and I got a Navy skirt 
and I got a white blouse with navy trim and I had little navy flats. And so there was this, okay, when you go in, you are going to go in and look like, you know, you are a student, you know what you're doing, you're going to be able to articulate certain things. So her thing was, we're not going to give them excuses. We're going to take away those excuses. So now you have to come up with something new. It's not going to be because I don't understand where I went to high school or what I'm interested in. It's not going to be about how I look. It's not going to be because she's not speaking or articulating what I want to do. And that was kind of the theme. And I feel like our young people, if you don't have that prep, we're giving people who don't look like us those excuses that they can use to say why I chose someone over this student. Um, yep. Or if there aren't enough of us to be part of that interview panel to help people understand why, yes, they might be a little bit quieter, but look at her background and look at what they've been working on and the organizations they're a part of. So it is it is something that I wish that there was more of an expanded pre-college program to help yeah. our kids get ready to mm -hmm. go into that space. And for them, it might be the very first time still. Mm -hmm. I like to jump in here. So I've got a few ideas. The first one is making sure that um, our young people understand the connection between their hobbies and careers. So mm -hmm. I, I heard someone mention video games. My brother loved video games, um, but he also had trouble studying because um, he had he was dealing with ADD back then. And um, I talked to him and said, well, have you thought about going to school to learn how to design video games? He was a great artist. Uh, he loved to draw. Um, and he loved technology, so he didn't end up becoming a video game designer, but he is uh, an engineer right now, dealing with the electronics, dealing with his hands. So finding out what your genuine interests are and how to discipline those crafts at an early age. Um, parents and other people, even teachers in their environment, noticing what those talents are and being able to proactively ask about those things or share those opportunities because a lot of people start off at a certain threshold of knowledge. If you don't know, if your knowledge is not a certain level, you don't even know what questions to ask. So sometimes as adults, we just have to share that information. Um, there's also a lot of value in organizations and even in school. So like bring your daughter to work day, bring your kids to work day. Seriously, my mother is the reason that I'm in the industry now. She worked at a TV station and I didn't have to go to an after school program. She would just pick me up and bring me there. And I could go to different parts of the TV station and I got cast in a commercial in third grade. And that's what started my, my career. And then she came back and got me two internships the summer after my 10th grade year, just with some of her colleagues. Mm -hmm. And I'm over 40 right now. I know I look young, but now I have 25 years of experience and they pay me like I do. So I have been the youngest person in the room. I have been the, I have been at the same time, one of three women in an entire company, the only black person and the youngest executive. And I wore that triple minority, like, like a badge of honor. It was like, bam, this is black excellence. What you want with it? You have to, you have to show up. You have to take space. And when it comes to things like marketing, take advantage of student activities like register student organizations is one of the most powerful things that you can take advantage of on the college campus. I got a 2.8 in undergrad. I didn't like class that much. I didn't like 16 weeks of sitting in the class and then you asked me at the end of the year or at the end of 16 weeks, what's the answer to all this stuff? Honey, I don't know. Why didn't you ask me in week two? <laughs> like, let's go in phases. <laughs> but I was able to get some real experience and some registered student organizations as an e-board member. That gave me an opportunity to make decisions, to work with budgets for sales, marketing, sponsorship development. I'm working with campus leaders. I ended up being a part of the student government where I am approving the, the university's budgets for different organizations that are coming in. And then don't wait for permission for somebody to come and tell you what you can do. If you have the ability to go create something, go create that. Create your own portfolio. You don't have to wait for an internship. If you think that the, the new ad for Target is ugly, open up Canva and make a new one and put that in your portfolio. 
Put mm -hmm. all that stuff together. And even before you have experience, what was your leadership? What, like, were you co-captain of the major red team? Were you section leader in the band? All those things add up because they're character builders. And it's not just about what is your experience. It's who are you and what do you have innately within you that can make you successful? So I mm -hmm. think all those things are very important in building your own experience. The number one thing is, do not wait for somebody to give it to you. Take as much as you can so that when the opportunity comes, you are already prepared as much as you can and say, hey, I did this much without any help. How much further do you think I can go if I just had your support? Mm -hmm. When you do have, so much, people can, are much more willing to help you out when they see that you've already taken the initiative on your own. I am going to propose a Marcy and Phoebe Roadshow. Just going to throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Phoebe. Let's go, girl. I'm ready. <laughs> I got my you know bad I, You know what I liked about what Marcy said is don't wait for people to give it to you. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be an internship. And I want to capitalize on volunteerism. Mm -hmm. You can volunteer even for the Boys and Girls Club, and there's going to be technology there. You know, the hashtag technology everywhere, technology cash, whatever we were saying. But um, the Army doesn't wait till you graduate to start going after you. So no. I would like for organizations and us and other people to go after young people while they're young. Don't, what happens a lot of times is, is their junior year where like a deer with headlights. Not everyone has parents that are supporting them and driving them. All they're asking, what are you going to do? You better find your own way to go because I'm not paying for it. So if that is the narrative for a lot of, not for a lot, for some, because I don't know, I don't have the research, what, how do they get access? And I think Marcy and, and a couple of others were saying, you have to go after it, you have to be connected to programs, but I think we can do more as corporate America. I think waiting to college and looking at the college students is too late. If it is. Could, if we could dive down even into grade school ages yep. and uh, just say, hey, what do you enjoy doing with your time and help them connect the dots, um, they'll be well on their way to see that it's possible um, and then help them find a way. Money should never stop you from going after a STEM career. Mm -hmm. Money there, and maybe people don't hear that enough, but money shouldn't stop them. Get a loan, figure it out, but do what you need to do to go after your dreams. Absolutely. All right. We are down to four minutes left. I know it's it time flew. So I'm just gonna um, I'm just gonna do a round robin final thoughts. I'm gonna start with Tamara. All right. Well, um, Thank you for this opportunity. And I guess what I would like to say, uh, which has probably been, was already said is, um, yeah, believe in yourself, take up space. Don't wait for anybody to give you permission. Just go ahead and do it and, uh, and engage, be curious, you know, um, and talk to people that may not look, look like you to get answers to your questions. Um, and just, yeah, never give up, believe in yourself. Renee. Um, my, one of my favorite stories is, um, or speeches is um, from Roosevelt and it was the, the man in the arena. And I keep that actually behind me, um, hidden behind my um, Zoom background because I believe that we have to be in the arena. And even though it might be difficult and you might fail and you might get scarred, it is better to be in the arena and fight the fight then sit in the cheap seats and try to give critiques and comments to other people who actually are doing it. Um, so my my hope, I, I I love and thank you, Crystal, because I think this is the best inspiration for, you know, kind of in the morning. This is the, a good way to start the day. Um, oh, good. And, you know, but I think for, for our young people, this is exciting. I, I am extremely excited and, you know, because there's a lot of creative energy and great ideas and there is opportunity and there are, there are people willing in your family 
or friends or even outside folks you know, that, that maybe aren't related to you, there are people surrounding you that are willing to encourage and help and connect the dots and give you support. Um, so this is absolutely the best time, whether it's black girl magic or if it's if it's just black people magic, this is absolutely the best time um, to be in this space today. Excellent. Lexi, final thoughts. Yes, I am super excited. This was great. I just want to say, you know, advocate for yourself. Um, use your network, build your network, and just know that you belong in the room where it happens. So don't be afraid, you know, to speak up and be who you are and contribute your knowledge because, you know, you're valuable. What we have to say is valuable and important. So I think just remember that and stick with that. Excellent. Patrice. Yeah, I would second that. Um, know your worth, be confident. I think the other thing is don't focus on a title, focus on a job that's going to bring you joy and it's going to allow you to do the things that you're passionate about doing. Success will come as long as you have the curiosity to learn, you have the willingness to go the extra mile and show up and be yourself every single day. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we're going to wrap up with a one-two punch of Marcy and Phoebe. Marcy, final thoughts. All right. Um, there was this quote from Steve Harvey that has really inspired me. And it talked about a lot, how you change your mindset to be more powerful by turning your why not into your why too. So if there are some things that are going on in your life that are distractions now that are pre preventing you from success, figure out how to spin that into motivation and use that as fuel to be fearless, be relentless towards your goals. Never give up, believe in yourself and know that anything is possible uh, if you just keep moving. Mm -hmm. Love it. And Phoebe. Well, I just want all people hearing this to know that you are significant. You might be underrepresented, but you're probably underestimated. So just know that everything that glitters isn't gold and don't compare yourself to anyone. You are the gold. So I'm telling you, Miss Phoebe is saying you are the gold. Don't compare, be courageous and take risks and do it afraid. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, you have so many fans and cheerleaders that wanna see you succeed but they're not hearing you open your mouth. So even if you don't know exactly where you wanna go, just let people know and ask them to help you get there. And STEM is one of the greatest opportunities. It's broader than just engineering, it's broader than scientists. And who knows, you might invent something. So do it afraid, be courageous, and you are significant. Awesome. So I have three philosophies in life. Um, it is easier to ask for um, forgiveness than permission. Um, no, never hurt anybody's feelings. Okay, maybe if it's your boyfriend, but no, never hurt anybody. So don't be afraid to ask the questions. It's okay if you get a no. Um, which dovetails into my last philosophy. If you can't get in the front door, there's a window on the side. Open that. You can get in. Um, ladies, I want to thank you so much for your time. And that's, and that's it. No isn't forever. No is just, and no just lets me know what's the next move I need to make anyway. So I needed to hear that. No, it's like, oh, okay. That's cool. Now I, I've got a second direction to go. But I want to thank all you ladies, all you ladies, you guys are awesome. You guys are, this is Black Girl Magic, everyone. This is Black Girl Magic. I'm just going to say that. I appreciate every single one of you guys for answering the call. Some of y'all at the last minute. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Latrice. Miss Latrice put off a massage to do this for me. And I appreciate you, girl. I do. Um, I appreciate each and every one of you guys. When I reached out, you guys took the call. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy and honored that you guys have joined us here. Um, and that's it. Um, and um, we will see you guys um, the 19th. Um, if you're in the Los Angeles area, 
please come. Black Entrepreneur Expo and Mixer, um, Trinity Lutheran um, Church in Inglewood are provided in Crenshaw. We've got like a fantastic lineup of vendors um, for you guys. Um, I know because I've spent a lot of money already. <laughs> so we are going to um, um, see you guys and thank you so much. 